Alright, welcome to another edition of What the Fuck Happenings Here. Not entirely in Mendham. Anyway, um, today, I think I will, uh, I think it's recording, um, talk about uh, the glib, I guess. Um, just this fact that people who don't really experience something, don't personally know of it, um, can't appreciate it. So you could argue this almost goes to the whole AI thing, that an artificial intelligence that doesn't know uh, what it is to feel, to have a feeling, isn't going to be very useful in terms of being intelligent, because it's going to be clueless about the most important thing to manage in the universe, which is this thing called a sentient being and its welfare. Um, nothing can really be stated to be more important, like, you know, chrome being really chromey, or diamonds being really sparkly. What, you know, what's going to be more important um, than managing um, the welfare of sentient organisms and, you know, some sort of equation that puts them in some sort of state that is, you know, worth it or better or improved or fixed. You know, again, it's always back to this argument that the intelligence really has the only utility of intelligence is to fix something that isn't working right. Otherwise, there's just nothing for it to do, um, frankly. So, uh, how to get there? Um, so, interesting, just going with the where my personal life goes is where your philosophy ends up going. Um, in a sense, uh, you can't you can't separate the influence of these personal events uh, in deciding your personal perspective kind of thing, you know, your philosophical. It's informing, you know, the information you get through your personal experience informs you. Uh, so anyway, so yeah, I had a dream last night, and you know, it's really crappy. Um, you know, my father was dying of a kind of a slow stroke. I mean, slow in the sense of it's happening over what seems like minutes in the dream. Um, and, you know, there's nothing you can do and blah, blah, blah. And it's just, you know, it's just a horrible thing to witness, you know. And um, his disability and dysfunction and kind of stress over uh, not working right. And then when I woke up today, you know, so it kind of puts you in a sour mood, <laughs> you know, less than optimistic mood for the day. And then, you know, I go for a run in the morning. I went for my run and, um, you know, there was an old lady, you know, 6.30 in the morning, whatever, kind of cool outside, um, you know, roaming around in her robe, which she, I've seen her before, um, but she has a dog. But I didn't realize, you know, she's gone Alzheimer's. And um, so anyway, she you know, waved at me. And so I came over and she was, she didn't, you know, she just didn't know where she's supposed to be. And she says, I, you know, she said things that were just so poetically, you know, why am I here? Um, I don't know why I'm here. You know, these kind of statements, um, you know, that could be taken as philosophical statements. And um, so, I mean, I knew she lived in one of these houses, so I just kind of walked back and forth with her a little bit until we could recognize her, until she could recognize what house she belonged to. And, uh, you know, I said the little comforting things like, no, you'll be all right, just a few minutes, you'll remember things, you know, it'll, it'll be okay, don't worry, you know, she's all stressed. Um, and you, but you're just seeing the doom in all of this, and it's just, you know, like, you know, where's this going? You know, it doesn't go anywhere good, <laughs> you know. Um, and this is something some people celebrate, let alone people who make excuses for it, you know, and just say, oh, it's the way it is. So that got me thinking about, you know, the whole rationalizations and excuse-making that people are so guilty of. And, and um, it got me thinking about, you know, house slaves and the difference, you know, between the field slaves and the house slaves and this whole acclimating to some preposterously silly circumstance 
and just making excuses for it you know it's like uh, oh well we we people are good at working and so yes it's good that we can do the work and make for you know they come up with some wacky notion that somehow this scheme is the way things should be you know that um oh it's a good job you know <laughs> You know, they treat me nice, they say something nice to me now and then, ask me how I feel, and so it's all okay that I'm a slave. I'm, I mean, you know, it's like, you know, what are you making excuses for? And um, so, you know, that's sort of how I'm seeing that there's a lot of people who have just acclimated to, um, like, somehow we're not supposed to take control, that we're not supposed to resist, we're not supposed to fight for better, we're not supposed to do all these things that seem to me to be perfectly rational things to do in the circumstance so no matter what thing was to ever gain intelligence in the universe it doesn't matter what thing does it whether it's humans or buffaloes or whatever whatever it, it uh, happens to that it gains some sort of perspective and capacity to you know glean information and collect information and process information if they're going to do it at all honestly, um, there's only one rational conclusion that this is a silly, um, bad ride created, this mechanism. They, we are only sentient for the purpose of building tools to, you know, crush the skulls of other organisms, um, or at least to manipulate or maneuver ourselves into a superior position, fighting with each other and fighting with the other species. And that's the reason why it exists. Um, is to be used in this malicious way, in this you know, um, negative way of, uh, you know, taking over, um, controlling, um, dominance, um, and exploitation. However you want to look at that, you know, it's a whole word by itself that's kind of important to the whole theme. Um, and so they, but you know, these people have this perspective that somehow that, you know, this rickety roller coaster, you could describe it as this really bad ride, you know, where you, you have these nice little high points, but then you have the part with the razor blades, you know, slit you open, the Alzheimer's, the nursing home, the, you know, be debilitated and, um, you know, have the quality of your existence, you know, reduced to a, <clears throat> you know, being grateful that you're not in horrific pain, you know, that's, that's all you've got anymore, it's just how much pain am I not in, is all you've got to cling to, <laughs> you know, just horrible circumstances, and they just glibly, these people just glibly look at this equation and somehow just makes excuses, you know, excuses for not resisting, not fighting, not uh, contemplating how to make it better or to um, cure it in the sense that just close the ride. <clears throat> we don't need the roller coaster. It really doesn't have a, you know, an essential function. It's a frivolous and trivial um, entertainment. Uh, that's all we can gain out of this existence is some trivial entertainment. And, uh, you know, some, you know, the, the best moments in people's lives are playing video games or watching movies or, you know, being completely disconnected from reality. And that right there is a huge commentary on, so you're tormenting people with, you know, dementia um, for maybe a decade. <laughs> so, so you can ride this stupid ride I mean come on it's stupid doesn't make any sense so that's where I sort of started from today and you know I read a few comments and all you know pretty useless people complaining I mean I you know it's nothing I mean Willie trolls you don't have a very good name Willie and I'm not very empathetic to people who are you know trolls on purpose um, just complaining. Oh, it's horrible here. I hate my life. I want to die. Blah blah. Yeah, fine. Okay. We all the you know pointing out that there is pain in the world isn't the problem. It's somehow getting them to people to, to recognize that it means something. That's the problem because they've 
negated it with some glib rationale that somehow makes it go away. So anyway, so there was a little bit of conversation about Schopenhauer, who you know I'd sort of put in the category, um, and uh, you know a troll, um, who I consider a troll, Jerry Hall, um, obviously a nihilist douche. Um, anyway, um, so he points out, no, Schopenhauer never argued for ending life. Well, I mean, from Schopenhauer's perspective, it's you know before the bomb and all that kind of stuff <laughs> before. Um, humans had really taken hard control of the universe. <laughs> you know, maybe it wasn't something he could, uh, you know, figure out in his head as a possibility. Maybe it was just that much more distant because of the fact that religion still ran the world and a lot of things. So maybe that would be a reason why he never... Um, I can't say he never said anything that was pretty fatalistic. Um, about the doom of the human race and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I just don't remember. But anyway, uh, he was more focused on how, how to cope with it. I don't think that's all there was there at all. Um, all he was focused on was making commentaries, frankly. Like a lot of these philosophers, the German philosophers, um, they, they're really good at complaining about stuff. They really sucked at offering solutions to anything. So they're really good at scapegoating and blaming I mean, Schopenhauer was a, a silly chauvinist. I mean, in the sense that his chauvinism was so silly. It was just so extreme and clearly um, motivated by the fact that he didn't like that um, his inheritance was controlled by his mother. And, um, you yeah, know, so that was his, his paycheck. And um, so a huge amount of resentment towards his mother, who was also... Um, kind of more popular than he was in his own time. So there's lots of, he had lots of mommy issues. Um, you know, but I'm just saying that his philosophy wasn't, um, in my opinion, rooted in anything deep. And there is a famous line I remember from Schopenhauer where he does the, um, oh, yo, and then this Buddhist thing. I got this Buddhist thing, and uh, this is the most fantastic philosophy or whatever. And it just completely lifted my whole perspective perspective and it's just so ironic right I mean this acknowledgement that life is suffering is somehow gave him great comfort and you're just saying how does that comfort a rational and intelligent organism how do you gain any comfort from this Buddhism slop um, which just seems so ironic um, to me I mean it just doesn't I can't make any sense of it at all uh, so anyway, so he didn't see him as a pessimist. Well, I think that would be just silly not to see him as a pessimist. He was clearly afraid. Um, he was he clearly could see that life had all these nasty fates in it. Um, so I, you know, I don't think he had any optimism in in the idea of reoccurrence and you know continuing to live these futile lives. So I think that's just silly. Um, not to think he wasn't pessimistic. He was complaining about everything. So I'm just saying he's, he's a constant and habitual complainer. Um, how can you call such a person not a pessimist? So anyway, I just thought that was a funny statement. And then, you know, there's almost a nothing comment here where somebody said, I had vertigo. You know, with someone in a video I mentioned that. And um, it's terrifying. Uh, and no one understands until it happens to them. So that's something that sort of just has to keep, I have to keep reminding myself that um, so much of what people think really does have to do with their personal life experience and philosophically, um, you know, it's, it's just unfortunately for too many people, the two tracks, you know, the philosophy track is following the, you know, the life track rather than the other way around. We're not what we are, what we're smart enough to understand. We are what we um, want to believe and what is what we choose to believe based on what makes us feel better um, or makes it more possible for us to navigate our personal problems. Something that makes them go away. Something that um, gives us hope. Um, you know, you see a pretty girl, um, you know, that, you know, 
falls in love with somebody who's a real loser and so then as a loser you feel more confident and oh well if he can do it I can do it you know that kind of thing <laughs> or some kind of you know bullshit like that that makes you think there's hope or purpose or function for you that somehow you have um, you know you have more control than you think you have because of some perception or rationalization and that's all these people are living on like the, the Hothla days um, you know just insanely irrational um, in this one area of his existence I mean in other areas he seemed to be able to follow along with what logic requires um, but in understanding the big picture no hope um, you know he's played the game that um, somehow you know something only matters if it matters to me you know that's the only way I can make something matter is I have to feel something and if I don't feel it therefore it doesn't exist and it's just such an irrational way of recognizing that you don't have to eat it you know you don't have to eat you don't, you don't have to be hungry or you like a particular food to recognize that somebody else could like it and it's food you know, but to say it's not food if I don't like it, that'd be silly. And it's not edible if I don't like it. Um, it's just uh, kind of irrational. So anyway, we'll go to another comment by the asshole. Uh, let's see. He might have been in this long crap. Somebody was going back and forth. Uh, no, it's not there. Where the hell is it? Yeah, there it is. All right, so that's one of them anyway. So words like cruel are so unscientific. Well, it's describing, you know, the glib in the sense that it's describing something that clearly isn't calculating correctly. You know, like, a, you know, some sadistic person who's causing something harm they're clearly getting something for that you know some sort of emotional high out of this incredible negative thing they're imposing so in that sense cruel does mean something it's describing a frame of mind okay where something somehow isn't recognizing um, and you know the, the argument would be it's it's not because they're incapable like a lion can't know, okay, it just can't. Um, that the animals it's eating, it can't know that they have a brain and they're doing the sentient thing and they're just like them and all that kind of, they can't do all that awareness thing. So their cruelty, you know, isn't really a real thing. They haven't done anything cruel, they've just done something stupid. But cruel is like a Hothla day, something that's perfectly capable of understanding pain and suffering because they personally experience it and kill themselves because of it and yet they'll pretend okay they don't know what it means when it's happening to somebody else that doesn't mean anything because I don't care about them I don't love them or something I mean I have to love them for them to mean anything I have to need them or want them in some way or have some use for them or I can't appreciate the fact that they're going through an experience and the experience is negative so, um, yeah, so you would argue that people who are perfectly capable of knowing that the animals they're shooting or something are running over in the street or some other thing are going to experience a whole bunch of negative sensations to be tortured, essentially. Um, and they don't, they don't consider it a real thing somehow. They don't consider it all meaningful. They've somehow negated the meaning of a sentient organism having an experience and you're saying well they can't do that out of ignorance I mean they just they can't be ignorant of the fact that it's a biological organism it has a brain it has blood it has you know, perception all of that stuff there's no way they can make any excuses to say it doesn't feel there's no way you can say oh they're just ignorant no they're insane is what they are they have some sort of bizarre philosophy that's allowed them to say it doesn't that's not the important thing in the universe the important thing in the universe is how I feel because it's evolution and I'm supposed to win and they're supposed to lose or something I don't know you can't even can't even I can't even imagine what kind of bad reasoning 
goes on in the head of somebody who, you know, like, like the psycho killer who tortures something before they kill it. You know, I mean, obviously they're feeding off of it. You know, they're personally gaining something from it. Um, but how can they possibly eat that? How could that be food? You know, how could that be psychological food to torture something? You know, impossible to make that make sense. All right. Um, uh, let's see. Words like cruel are so unscientific and religious. So, you know, it's, a, it's obviously a word describing a certain frame of mind, you could argue, um, or the nature of a circumstance where it's, you know, the cruelty of nature could be argued. It, you don't really need the intent of nature. It's just the overt act is so bad. Um, you know, the lion cubs getting bitten by the cobra or something um, that it's just by its overt appearance so ugly and bad that you apply this word to it um, but to say it's unscientific I think is kind of silly um, you can make it more rigorous by description and we certainly need a word to describe something that's beyond the pale okay be beyond just a simple word of, um, oh, that is causing some kind of torment. You know, you, you sort of need a word that says a little more than that. Anyway, let's see, like you were disappointed in God. So just, you know, two references to religion in two sentences when they're the one with the rationalizing philosophy, the one where they somehow have some redemption uh, something that makes it all worthwhile to them, okay, <laughs> which I would call a figment of their imagination <laughs> and nothing that they could ever articulate as being a real thing. Like, again, stating that evolution, the unintelligent design, has function. How does the unintelligent design have a function? By, by what logic did you mean that scribbly lines are a beautiful portrait of something. You just scribbled. How does scribbling make art? Uh, anyway, I like to think of life as a slightly higher order of things. So you're the one using God words now. When we know there's no order of the thing, okay? It's just a DNA molecule uh, evolving tools for dominance. And that's it. Um, you know, fingers, fingernails, every bit of it is is there because it gains some advantage in some circumstance. And they're, so they're they're basically all vestigial things. You know, our fingernails are kind of vestigial. They made sense when they were claws. They don't make much sense now, but they, you know they have some utility. <laughs> you know, they're not completely useless, um, but they're nowhere where they they're they're. They're nothing like where they came from, where they started as, as a weapon, as a, as a real tool. Um, uh, and you can just go through all of our features or the byproduct of that kind of process. But, you know, it's just a slightly higher order, like this is order, when, you know, there's nothing ordered about it except for it's a stupid mechanism, you know, that just merely says... Um, you know, make three things and then force the three things to evolve, to survive. And they'll end up just killing their brother and sister, so to speak. Um, there's no order to that kind of nonsense. Uh, you know, no order in terms of anything that can be rationally or logically understood as a great idea. So anyway, uh, moving on. Um, in space you have complete chaos. So even that word, what does that even mean, chaos? You don't have any intelligence. So that's, a, that's the word for it. Okay, I mean, order, um, you know, comes out of some sort of process, um, some sort of reasoning, something to, um, you know, it's an organization, I guess, pattern. And, yeah, there's no pattern except the pattern of, creating feeding machines you know they consume parts to make you know the Xerox copy 
for no function, just to make copies. All right, well, anyway, frozen rocks flying around for no reason. And yes, and we're not doing anything for any reason either. So, I mean, we're manipulating words and manipulating objects and manipulating things for a reason. I mean, the all the way back reason, which is just dominance. Not, you know, no other purpose really involved but just somehow this idea of uh, maintaining, uh, you know, a, a, a piece of, it's not even your identity, you know, because your identity isn't the identity that's being preserved. You're, you're just maintaining a bunch of vestigial pieces, a bunch of pieces of a past, and that's it. And they all slowly fade away, you know, all the, all the stuff that we were made of, that we were, we're not anymore. We're not green slime anymore. So, I mean, green slime is being left out of the future, so to speak. Um, I mean, all the things that we were in our transition to this point are hardly recognizable anymore. Uh, anyway. Um, Deadly radiation and temperatures close to zero. Well, you can't have it both ways. <laughs> you know, deadly radiation is not uh, zero temperature, uh, obviously. So that little mistakes like that are sort of revealing of how superficial you thought about it. Um, we're actually in the higher, you know, medium radi radiation zone, you know. But anyway... On Earth, it's also chaos, but calm enough, you know, for life to exist. Yeah, so there's, it's somewhere between the zero and the, you know, too much radiation. Big deal. Like, you know, yes, <laughs> you know, those zones are going to have to exist when you have the two possibilities of hot and cold. Well, yeah, then you're going to have something in between. Um, but anyway, um... It's also chaos, but calm enough for life to exist. And life meaning what? You know, by definition, is life cells? You know, are they alive, or are the collection of cells a living thing? Again, we're not, we're not life in the sense that we're not the DNA molecule. We're a really complicated, um, you know, arrangement of living things. You know billions and billions of living things so you know what's buildings and what's cities you don't call cities buildings and you don't call buildings cities so why why are you using the word life what do you mean by that word but anyway we'll continue um evolution is a balance of terror and so i'd say this is the evidence of a glib person right because terror doesn't mean anything to him as a word doesn't it doesn't so what <laughs> you know big deal who cares terror so yeah so what um it only matters if it happens to him so if he's terrorized then terror means something but if terror exists in the universe so what it's not just a word it doesn't mean anything all right if predators don't eat the herbivores so this is just more you know jargon to defend meat eating or something like we're predators, you know, like that's our real history, or our real lineage, when it, it just clearly is not. We have no tools to be a predator. We could only eat dead things. It's the only thing a human being is going to catch and kill is something that's already dead. Um, so it's just such a joke. Um, but again, to defend a kind of, you know, like somehow the system makes sense, you know. That, oh, oh yeah, well, this is the balancing agent, see. And it's there's no balance in it, um, in the sense that all you're doing is killing something. You're forcing something to go through these experiences that are clearly negative. And for what purpose? Just so you can do the same, have the same thing done to you. I mean, the whole predator thing kind of falls apart when you see the, you know, the little fish eats the littler fish, and then the bigger fish <laughs> eats that fish, and then the bigger fish eats that fish. You kind of lose this whole, what does this predator thing even mean? Um, because they all get preyed upon. 
um, you know, human civilization is getting preyed upon by a little piece of RNA virus at the moment. I mean, it's winning big, you know, in terms of um, destroying and crumbling, you know, the, the clouds you're living in. Uh, but anyway, um, all right. if predators don't eat the herbivores, that's just more b bullshit, like, <laughs> we could put things in these classifications. Um, they would become too many. Uh, so, you know, clearly everything evolves into the environment it exists in. And so the, that'll be always be the balance is how much food is there and, you know, what is what attrition is there. And lots of organisms can have different strategies. So they can win by just making a lot of babies and letting a lot of them die, or they can win by having very few, but you know, creating little you know, castles for them to live in and protect them. So there's lots of even small organisms that don't have a whole bunch of children. Um, you know, kinds of plants, lots of things that, you know, don't play the, you know, uh, make a million of it strategy. They, they do the protect it kind of strategy. Uh, anyway, so there's lots of different strategies out there and there's no, this isn't any kind of underlying theme. Uh, it's just a fact that it's a crowded planet. They're all trying to do the same thing, which is climb the hill, you know, to get to the top. And so they're pulling each other down and doing all kinds of tricks and everything else to get to the top first because whoever gets to the top gets to eat all the cupcakes and win, whatever that is. All right, so anyway, um, eat all the grass and die from starvation. So again, it's not really, you know, as a practical fact. Um, they can always migrate to greener pastures and that's lots of strategies are built in there and so the numbers can get quite huge. But yeah, there's always going to be some point, some mechanism to prevent it from, just like you can't get really, really big. Like Tyrannosauruses couldn't be three times as big because gravity would make a mess of them. And um, so there's always some sort of limiting factor that prevents you from uh, taking over but you could say there's other like stuff like funguses right funguses zillions of spores all kinds of things but there's a huge limitation on their replication um, because of maybe a simple strategy which was learned very early and it wasn't learned it was just that all the stuff that didn't apply the strategy didn't survive and so a key part of surviving isn't so much being a predator is understanding that you don't want to be food so if nothing becomes dependent on eating you okay then uh, or finds you valuable to their survival then you won't be preyed upon and uh, you know you won't have to have millions of babies anymore so don't be food so don't be so plentiful that something can live off of you that's also a winning strategy. But anyway, um, let's see, where was I? Okay, too many and eat all the grass and die of starvation. There's a higher order, whatever that means, than outer space, but things like disease and suffering are inevitable. So what does that mean? So what? So if it's inevitable that somehow that makes it okay? I don't even, you know, it's not worth and inevitable in what sense? Like, why? Why does it have to be inevitable? What's inevitable? Like, it's almost like saying slavery is inevitable. When no, it doesn't have to be inevitable. Um, like, lots of things can just be stopped. You don't have to do them anymore. So there's nothing inevitable about the disease and suffering, except for the assholes making it. So I mean, if you don't make something that can get diseased and suffer then obviously you've prevented disease and suffering. So, um, yeah, if you want to be part of this biological thing, do with this DNA crap and, you know, that's going to be, it's, it'll be the inevitable price paid for playing the game. So if you're going to keep shoving children on the roller coaster, you're going to keep killing them. But again, that's an argument on my side, not on your side. <laughs> you know, 
um, but there's certainly nothing we there's nothing preventing us from saying uh, no I'm not going to be a slave anymore so yes go ahead and kill me once and get it over with but you're not going to enslave my kids um, <clears throat> we can't escape entropy so again he, he thinks that the these that, that somehow entropy means we're going to get more complicated when obviously that's not what the universe is doing so you know the the universe is falling apart it's not getting more complex that's the future for the universe so I mean to say we can't escape it is kind of a silly thing to say when the whole universe is going to escape it in the sense the whole universe is going to fall apart um, and clearly we could make it fall apart sooner um, we can take this complexity out of the game and there's nothing about the in complexity that's intrinsically good so why am I even having the argument in the first place I mean you haven't demonstrated anything precious about this higher order that the higher order is a better order you can't make a reasoned argument explaining how torturing things is a great idea <laughs> you know like somehow you're doing something so spectacularly worthwhile that it's worth torturing so that doesn't make any sense but I mean this whole idea that there's something about nature itself that says this has to happen and even if it was inevitable which I don't believe that this very unique evolution that took place on earth that this very um, it had uh, so many one time events in it um, this really improbable you know winning of the lottery six times in a row the idea that it happens all the time in the universe is just a statement it isn't based on anything called reasoning you have no evidence that you could get past even creating a neuron let alone neurons that eventually become capable of contemplating their existence I mean it, without humans on earth uh, you know the IQ of the planet's pretty low uh, anyway um, shit happens no matter how hard you try whatever that means so shit happens no matter how you how hard you try to what prevent the shit so clearly you can prevent lots of shit okay you can invent airbags and you can do lots of things to mitigate how much shit happens so that's just more this is just how the glib disengage from being reasonable and rational and taking responsibility they want to pretend it doesn't matter what I do that I can't fix anything I can't make the world a better place you can't uh, correct any of the the liabilities you, you can't annihilate smallpox oh wait a minute yeah you can you, you know that, that we can't prevent polio you know of course we can these is lots of things we can do um, and the harder we try to do those things the more likely is we're going to be able to do them so there's lots of things we could do to fix things we just choose not to do it because we don't want to spend the money it's like we don't want to spend resources on homeless people so we let them eat garbage and <clears throat> you know people get old and uh, debilitated and all this stuff and we don't really have a great plan for any of that except to you know put them in a prison of sorts <laughs> you know um, you know no great plan um, but lots of harm and lots of suffering can be mitigated uh, it's just that lots of people have a vested interest in maintaining it like you know the medical industrial complex um, is the real obstacle to their being um, effective euthanasia and, and uh, you know right to die because they make so much money maintaining the broken system and so lots of people are invested in the torture they make money on it and um, they just glibly pretend they're doing good when they're really bad doers and it's just a fact all right there are billions of ways to destroy a glass but only one way to put it back again and so what is that how does that even apply to anything in here I mean what does that mean I, I you know there's just no yeah so there's a billion ways to break it so why don't we break it um, and but what does the putting it back again thing have to do with anything I mean what is what does the analogy have to do with our circumstance there's nothing difficult about us um, preventing the glass from breaking um, I mean there's lots of action we can take where you know, we can make the world a better place and less harmful 
and the easiest action is just to say let's close the roll close the roller coaster kills too many okay so the whole the whole thing just depends on assholes like this finding a reason to turn the crank on the meat grinder and you're saying well why don't you just stop turning the crank and then it'll be over all the bad stuff goes away don't make a glass you don't have to worry about breaking one um, all right there's a billion ways to destroy a glass but only one way to put it back again it's just such a funny statement as humans we feel sad when things don't go our way so again that's how you think I guess the only way that matters is your way and you never appreciate the fact that all the ways are happening to things that are all the same and so all the ways it goes bad are really bad for me from my perspective I can't see it as a winning game if I'm seeing losers being made why would I jump in if I know my risk is the same as everybody else's risk of being one of those losers why would I pull a ticket and say I want to go yeah I want to go take a chance to be a loser what fun that'll be no thank you um, what, what reasoning would be applied you have to have some reason to do that so what's your reason to pull that ticket um, all right uh, as humans we feel sad when things don't go our way but it but it's all possibility probability so I, I don't know how, how did you deduce that you know so this is probably back to the physics argument he does make some silly physics arguments so he thinks the universe really does run on something called probability or something and that there's probabilities that are preventing us from being reasonable when you know the obstacles and the events are all deterministic so I guess he doesn't believe in that um, he doesn't believe you have to practice the piano to play the piano um, that you have to think about a subject you know to be able to be intelligent on that subject that you might have to have um, research the evidence to understand the evidence uh, now he doesn't have to do any of that because it's some dopey probability there's no probability curves that are preventing human beings from acknowledging the circumstance which is yes all of my ambitions are silly okay all my personal um, uh, perception of some glory are trivial compared to the real pain that's going to be experienced um, to play this stupid game um, you know the real terrorized terrified old ladies you know who can't find their houses and all of the other murders little murders taking place every day if there was a God who created it he might have thought of a solution but there isn't that's not even a complete thought either so he's saying there wouldn't be a solution even for a god <laughs> yeah um, I think God's solution was kill everybody so you know that's part of the little fable is that his solution was kill them all and start over and that didn't work either uh, <laughs> apparently um, you know all of them except a little Noah's family kind of thing um, but anyway um, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, obviously the solution is simple it's just a ride at a, a carnival you just close the carnival so there's nothing complicated about the choice and the decision and it's not that hard to do and it's not beyond our means it's just a matter of being beyond will and you're willing against it for some reason so why if it's a completely possible thing are you making arguments trying to discourage people from thinking it's not only possible but yeah it's almost simple why are you assuming it to be impossible and improbabilistic and all this other stuff when you don't have any evidence indicating it is I mean again I can point out that every evidence is, is it takes a minor bit of civilization to prevent pregnancy 
uh, the civilized countries prevent it really easily and therefore even without being pessimists um, they behave as extinctionists so, so all you need to do is have a little bit of that those civilizing kind of rules like you don't have babies when you're 12 and you know those kinds of little bits of rules that'll make all the difference and so it's really easy to get there um, and yet you're saying on purpose telling other people trying to persuade them somehow that it's futile and there's no way to win and we all must be slaves to this insipid stupid DNA molecule you know uh, there's nothing requiring it and again there's nothing demonstrating in any way that you could ever that there's any probability like any like it's so remote a probability if I was to blow the earth back to green slime that there's any evidence that green slime always evolves into intelligent organisms you know one's capable of contemplating their existence the reasonable speculation would be that no there's all kinds of ways that it won't get there that it'll be like the ocean the smartest thing in the ocean is you know that that started in the ocean and that's where life started um, what's the smartest thing I mean you know a shark <laughs> you know there's no uh, awareness happening it, it doesn't have any utility it doesn't mean anything in the DNA struggle and it's only by some bizarre set of circumstances that um, organisms became where there became some connection or utility again you have to have the ability to go to school and learn before there's a school and it's kind of a tricky thing to evolve the ability to go to school before there's even a school to go to that's tricky evolution um, so that's sort of what we fell into we, we gained the ability to do all this abstract thinking for some really small reason okay not a big reason it satisfied a very small advantage um, and although we had the capacity to take so much more advantage of it you know with language but anyway I've made these arguments before uh, so here's another silly rip statement by the Jerry okay uh, sadness is a real thing that happens <sighs> No, no. Sadness is a real thing, and happiness is a real thing, too. So, this is more like baby talk. Yeah, everybody knows that part, right? Let's, okay, let's agree that there, the words were invented to describe some kind of real thing that happens to real individuals. Um, but the fact is, you don't take them to mean anything, and that's the problem. You don't think they have real value difference. Um, anyway easy to forget one of them when you are in the state of the other so this is more of this um, your sadness made you sad <laughs> you know or some kind of crap like that um, not awareness um, and I can just throw at him all day long the ignorance of bliss you know bliss of ignorance um, that, that's all he's living on is evading uh, taking account for what really is taking place and just existing in a delusionally glib little bubble of bullshit of rationalizations and justifications um, and you know so uh, arguing pessimism versus optimism is pointless because there's a, the only thing that matters is what's the truth and you think the truth is on some sort of optimism side when it can't be <laughs> okay it's gotta be it's less than what you think it is for certain but anyway um, I suspect this channel mostly attracts those who feel sad well that's a reasonable thing to suspect obviously you as the previous statement said I mean often to have any appreciation for something you have to experience it and if you don't personally experience it you just you know oh, so what so what so what so I mean and we just can't feel other people's pain so I mean I I don't get to have black plague and know what it's like and I don't get to have smallpox and I don't get to have polio 
and I don't get to have, you know, be born with no legs, and I don't get to experience all the different things that can be experienced, and how, you know, being blind, and all these kind of things, and so, I'll, um, you know, I lack appreciation um, from personal experience, but I can gain appreciation from recognizing, oh, it's much like our and if I want to be fair, I can say it's even worse than my worst this or my when I had that or when this happened to me. I can understand that these other things would be worse or better than those things. I can make comparisons and understand them as being negatives and appreciate just how bad it would be. And um, clearly that's what I find the most terrifying about your whole perspective is this idea that you're looking you you can recognize the real world and say yes look at all the number of the amount of people losing today versus the people winning and what's the you know what's the value of the winning state of mind which is some stupid notion of advantage oh i gained a little advantage today and so i feel good um and the price being paid by all the people who aren't who are losing that advantage and to think that somehow this these silly notions of accomplishment can in any way wash away this blood of the terror and the fear and the horror and the absolutely terrible pain and torment taking place is just amazing. And you're basically asserting that, yes, if somebody presents you with these tickets to pick, you know, the straws, just hand you straws, and says, yes, this straw, you'll be a delusional douchebag who, you know, didn't give a shit and just took advantage where he could and he was lucky. He didn't he didn't experience too many miserable debilities and was somehow, you know, quickly and expeditiously eradicated from existence. And so he didn't even pay by dying badly. And that's like the best case scenario. That's the best straw you can pull. And the rest of the straws are all shit. I mean, just, you know, uh, failure. Um, um, it's better, there's a better word somewhere, um, you know, of, 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 of just this, this struggle to get somewhere and find out you got nowhere, you know. So it's like you bought Paradise Island and you find out the sand is all full of dioxin or something. It's a chemical waste dump. Um, you know, that's the other straw you're going to pull, is the loser straw. And you're saying you have real reason. You have some kind of reason to sit there and face the the real straws. And there's some reason you're going to pull one. There's so many human lives that are so cool and great that you'd want to live. And so many animal lives that are just so perfect and great. <laughs> you know, that you feel really good about pulling these straws. You know, even though I could tell you being a sea turtle or something, I could hand you the the the, the box of straws, and there's ten thousand straws where you're dead within five weeks. You know, and then there's fifteen straws where you get to live a little longer, and then there's one, you know, two straws where you know you actually get to have sex someday. <laughs> you know, you're gonna pull us one of those straws. You're telling me honestly that you're you're just can't wait to get a chance to pull those straws of being digested inside of something's stomach. You want to experience the fun of it. Uh, you want to have one of your little flippers bitten off and have to you know, spend five weeks learning how to swim without your flipper and just to get killed anyway because now you can't compete <laughs> you know, because your, your flipper's broken. Uh, yeah. I'm supposed to believe you? <laughs> oh, that that makes sense? No, it doesn't make any sense. You're an idiot. Um, so anyway. I, you know. <sighs> Nihilists, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're, they exist in the world. I mean, they probably talk more than their actual numbers represent, you know. Because they are, they tend to be such arrogant and full of themselves kind of uh, personalities. So maybe they just talk a lot. Um, so they get overrepresented. Uh, because I think most people are um, more insecure 
and um, the only security they gain is from their numbers like the religious people and if you can isolate them from their pride you know isolate them from their the their family or gang strength um, you can you can find the their weaknesses and break them down um, to the truth um, but you know the nihilist the glib do have a real advantage um, in the sense that they've so reinforced this notion that the only thing that matters is um, you know I'm winning <laughs> period and that's just so stupid so until they're losers until they get the disease they're just not going to care that the disease exists something like that um, they can't even imagine feeling their pain uh, or something like that so anyway I had higher hopes for this video but <laughs> it is what it is um, the story really is just the evolution story I mean it really is the background for the conversation and there's no function to this ride we're on there's no it's it's can't produce anything that it it only breaks and then fixes and breaks and fixes it's um, like having a machine that can only function by breaking something and then fixing it why would you invent such a thing it's can't accomplish anything it's not doing anything productive and then if you understand that the breaking part is really expensive and that something actually gets hurt you know by the breaking and all you you don't undo the pain you cause by breaking it and all you do is restore it to its original condition so you eventually stop the pain so you just make pain and then cure it you give something a disease and then cure the disease well the fact that you cured the disease doesn't mean that what you did was really stupid because there's this whole bunch of pain and suffering and, and that you never needed to exist and you made it exist so you didn't accomplish anything yeah you cleaned up a mess but you cleaned up a mess you made I mean uh, nobody would invent a robot that functions that way right you know just you know a robot that pisses on the floor and then he cleans up the piss or something I mean, you know, who would who would invent this and who would defend it as existing uh, some for for some purpose except somebody really stupid I mean somebody who's not doing logic very well Jerry so anyway I'll leave it at that I think and uh, yeah, so I was going to try to make more videos this week, but it didn't happen. I had other projects and whatnot. But yeah, maybe I'll try to get a couple in this week. And um, uh, economics, take one more shot at it. Um, just in the sense that it's all so fixable. In the sense that all the mess we've made is only a mess if we don't clean it up the right way. <laughs> you know, and we can clean up the, the easiest way to clean it up is just to f forget about this whole idea that we need billionaires because we really don't they don't serve a real useful purpose they aren't doing anything magical um, I mean it's just a fact you could just you know right now if I could give all the owners of industry uh, a virus that killed them the earth would not be in any kind of tragedy because all the managers and all the people making businesses run and all the people really doing all the work would still be perfectly healthy so everything would do just fine the owners are so f superfluous to the function uh, of our existence and um, we're going to sink the boat to try to save them and that's just so stupid because they really aren't necessary alright so until the next time they're not even useful. They're, they've just slowed down our function. They've never, they're, they've never been anything but drag. Um, so, just.
just you know just pointing out that like I said the nothing falls apart unless we let them ruin it so anyway till the next time and such